Welcome to Psydactic, Residency Edition. I am Dr. O, and this episode is a continuation of our series on signs of catatonia. Today, I'll discuss catalepsy, posturing, grimacing, and waxy flexibility. I grouped the diagnostic signs that I am going to cover today because they are all similar. Your patient acts like a wax statue. If you are encountering this episode without listening to the whole series on catatonia, I suggest that you back up to episode 11 and start from there. Today, I'm going to discuss how to identify the signs of catatonia that cause a patient to either hold a position against gravity or give a steady resistance to changing that position. They act like a wax statue from Madame Tussauds. This requires some level of involuntary muscle tone. It's important to distinguish between being rigid and being statuesque. Someone who is rigid may be experiencing involuntary muscle tone due to Parkinsonian symptoms or extrapyramidal symptoms. Torticollis, for example, when a patient is turning their head to the left or the right due to involuntary contraction of the sternocleidomastoid, although it could be mistaken as an activity holding a part of the body against gravity, it is not a sign of catatonia. It's more likely a pathological sign of dopamine antagonists. A rigid-appearing patient may also be experiencing a seizure. Catatonia is different. One of the frustrating things about catatonia is that many of its signs are basically rule-outs. Another frustrating thing is that the signs often seem to be similar or even subsets of each other. For example, I've discussed mutism. It's likely to present in stupor, so... Is this basically counting stupor twice? But mutism can be present without stupor as well, so it seems like you shouldn't count it in stupor. And what in tarnation is the difference between catalepsy, grimacing, and posturing? In my reading, I have found nothing satisfying. But I did encounter some descriptions that might or might not be helpful. Posturing can be defined as the patient putting oneself into a position that's not accomplishing any task and holding that position for an oddly long period of time. It seems to require some level of awareness and at least a limited interaction with the world. This is in contrast to stereotypy when A patient is actually performing some pointless action repetitively for a long period of time. In posturing, they're holding a pointless position in a way that seems to require some effort. But they're not doing anything. The defining characteristic of posturing then can be that the patient has initiated the posture. Catalepsy, on the other hand, can be diagnosed For example, if the examiner puts the patient into a posture and they maintain that posture seemingly without any effort of their own. I recently read the best summary of catalepsy that I've yet found. Please forgive me for butchering these names, but it's from Widjeman and Jankovic. The article title is Movement Disorders in Catatonia in the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry in 2015. I quote, Catalepsy refers to the maintenance of fixed postures in the sitting or standing position for prolonged periods of time with minimal movement regardless of external stimuli, including pain. A feature of catalepsy that seems to distinguish it from simple posturing, where the patient just puts themselves into a posture and maintains it, is that 
The patient also seems to have some level of impaired awareness in catalepsy, or is not responding in their normal way to the world. The posture is, or could be considered, active in that it requires maintenance against gravity, but it is less intentional. The patient does not appear to have put themselves in that posture. Catalepsy seems to be a combination of maybe stupor or mutism or negativism with posturing to form a new category. The peculiarly vague definition of many psychiatric terms has been a theme in many of my episodes. And the difference between posturing and catalepsy seems to fit that theme. It gets more complicated when you throw in waxy flexibility. A patient may be posturing or cataleptic and not have notable waxy flexibility. Say, for example, you have a patient sitting up in bed holding their arms in front of them in fists like an Irish fighter. The patient initiated the pose. Here you have posturing. Now say you tried to put the patient's arm in a different position, but they actively resist. Here you have negativism. You know it's not just rigidity because it's such an oddly human posture, and it's not a seizure because of the bilateral nature and lack of any movement. Now, imagine that when you went to move the patient, you were able to reposition them But as you did, you noticed that they gave even resistance. Then, after you repositioned them, they maintained that posture. In the process of repositioning them, you noticed that they had waxy flexibility. But then, after you repositioned them, if they maintained that posture, do they now qualify as having both posturing and catalepsy? It's very confusing. They initiated the first position, but not the second position. So do they qualify for both? It's also important to note that there's no criteria that a patient's entire body must be waxy, but I imagine that it should be more than just a finger. I say this because once I had a patient who was posturing by standing up like a toy soldier in the middle of the room with arms hanging at his side. I told him, I'm going to move your arms now, and found them to be pretty much limp. They just fell back down when I let go. However, when trying to move his shoulders, there seemed to be more steady resistance, and if I raised them up in a shrug pose, they stayed there. When I moved on to his head, that's where I encountered more obvious and steady resistance. When trying to rotate, flex, extend, and bend the head toward the shoulder, it felt like it was moving through jello, but it didn't bounce back. When I placed his head in a position, it remained there. The same was not true of his arms, which had just fallen back to his sides when I released them. At the time, I decided to call this axial waxy flexibility because the muscles that attached more medially had increased even tone. After two milligrams of Ativan, his right foot started tapping, and the release slowly crept up until he opened his eyes, said hello, and then sat down on the bed. The next conundrum I have is grimacing, and I just conceptualize it as facial posturing. But it could also be facial catalepsy, though I have not yet read of anyone placing someone else's face into a position just to see if it would stay there. But I imagine that the temptation to do so at some point was too much for at least one clinician to resist. I have seen one patient who is diagnosed with catatonia but resistant to a benzo challenge. The first time I saw him, I entered the room and said, Hello. He turned his head to me, eyes wide open, and said, 
Hello. Then turned his face back forward, head lifted off the bed, staring forward. The other doctors and nurses had not been able to get him to interact with them for a few days, and I was unsuccessful getting him to interact with me again over the next two weeks. What sticks in my head were his wide eyes, forehead lined, eyebrows high. It's not easy to maintain an expression like that, but he did so for a few minutes, like it just got stuck there on his face. Patients who posture or demonstrate catalepsy may or may not also grimace. So looking for grimacing along with other signs may help confirm that this is catatonia and not something else. In the last few episodes, I've taken a closer look at nine signs of catatonia, including some of the hypoactive or retarded signs, um, including this episode content of catalepsy, posturing, grimacing, and waxy flexibility, as well as stupor, mutism, and negativism in a previous episode. I have also discussed a few of the hyperactive or excited signs of catatonia, including mannerisms and stereotypy. What I have neglected so far are echolalia, echopraxia, and agitation, comprising the remaining hyperactive signs. I have also promised but failed to deliver thus far a discussion of the Bush-Francis catatonia rating scale, which includes even more signs of catatonia. I've saved this for the last because I wanted to deal with the core features of catatonia before getting on to rating its severity. I appreciate your patience in this. I am Dr. Rowe, and this has been an episode of Psydactic Residency Edition. <laughs>